Chapter 3. Life as an Army Brat Throughout this book, I discuss pivotal turning points and lessons learned over the years. But how I was raised, I believe, had a tremendously positive impact on everything I would do following childhood. As mentioned earlier, I grew up in an Army family. That made me what is affectionately referred to as an Army Brat. Riddle me this. Imagine yourself as a 12-year-old. You've lived your entire life in the United States. The years you can remember, that is. The land of the free, the home of the brave. The usual comforts of home are the norm, and you are naturally complacent with everything around you. You have malls, movie theaters, and endless restaurants at your disposal. You are heading into your teens, which are easily the most impressionable years of your developing young life. Then, you find out that you are moving to Germany. At first, it isn't that big of a deal because you are used to moving every few years, but then, there it is. What is it? Well, it is the feeling of anxiety, your stomach in knots, the sadness of realizing that you are leaving the friends you just made, the fear of what will inevitably be the first day of school in a place where you know not one other soul. Ah, it is almost too much to handle. The questions swirling through your head are mostly unanswerable, and you just want to put your face in a pillow and scream. And you do, more than once. It helps for a second, but then all of the feelings of fear come rushing back. Your parents are positive, they show empathy, and do their best to ease your mind and help you understand why you are being uprooted once again for what feels like the hundredth time. Finally, the day has come. You've said your tearful goodbyes. You've stood in an empty bedroom that is no longer yours. Your suitcase is bursting at the seams as you drag it down the hall and out to the overloaded family car. The car starts and the journey to the airport begins. You watch out the window as the streets and houses you have found so comfortingly familiar for the last few years quickly disappear into the distance. In your mind, you are convinced you will never see those places again. There's no turning back. This is real. The plane you board is bigger than you have ever flown previously. You ask yourself, what the hell is Lufthansa? You proceed to your seat, and along with your family, you settle in for what is your new home for the next eight to nine hours. It's the longest, loneliest flight of your young life. This was my reality as an army brat in 1999. I don't remember much from the flight, but my first memory on the ground in Germany were the signs in a language I had never seen before. What a strange feeling. My dad had already relocated to Germany a few weeks before us and would be meeting us at the airport. That's right. My mother transported three rowdy boys, a pile of luggage, and a chocolate lab from Washington, D.C. to Frankfurt, Germany. She's a freaking saint. When my dad met us at the airport, I remember seeing him, in uniform as usual, excited to welcome us. The first thing I wanted was a Diet Coke. Anyone who knows me, then or present day, will not be surprised by this. I have an incredibly unhealthy addiction to Diet Coke. Hey, I could be addicted to some other types of Coke, so it's not that bad. I digress. My dad pulled out a few Deutschmarks from his pocket and bought me a soda from a nearby stand. German currency, great. Another thing to learn, I thought to myself. But I had a soda, so I was a tad bit happier. Up next was the drive to our new home. Let's see if I can accurately set the stage. Imagine a large hill. On that hill, perched at the very top, sat two structures. One was a hotel, and the other, my house. Surrounding these two structures was farmland with goats on one side and a German neighborhood on the other. I remember being a bit taken aback by the size of our house. It was bigger than any previous house and certainly looked unique. It had a large flat area of the driveway surrounded by a brick retaining wall and tall mature trees in front and back. The color of the house was a light desert tan with a big brown wood front door. Hanging to the right of the front door, proudly, as if to send a message, was my father's army squadron insignia belonging to the 1st Squadron, 1st Cavalry Regiment, or 1-1 Cav. 
This house was specifically reserved for the squadron commander and his or her family. Looking back, it was a tad bit strange to have the commander's house by itself on a hill next to some goats and a hotel, rather than on an army installation. Although this was pre-9-11, so the concerns of present day didn't exist at that point, at least not to the degree that we know today. That would soon change, but we'll get to that later. The house had an interesting smell. It was a mix between fresh paint and temporary furniture. I never knew temporary furniture had a smell, but it did. Like something that has been sitting in storage. Our household goods would not arrive for a few more weeks, so the temporary furniture would have to do for the time being. The house had five bedrooms and three bathrooms. There were also two kitchens, which was pretty cool. My room certainly wasn't large by any means, but like I had done so many times before, I made it my space. After checking out the new house, I wanted nothing more than to call back to the States and talk with my friends. They had moved on with enjoying their summer, but I couldn't help but feel stuck in this strange limbo of denial and acceptance. It sounds archaic saying this, but at the time, we had to use calling cards to make international calls. It was the year 2000. The cell phone era was in its infancy, and our family computer had not arrived yet. The hotel next door had a payphone, and I used it when I could, but it was often out of order, so I ventured out. Why not use my home phone? What preteen wants to talk to their friends on the phone in front of their family? As I ventured out, I found a phone booth about 15 minutes away, positioned next to a road across from an old German military building and parallel to a current German police station. That would have to do. I completed this phone booth pilgrimage daily for several weeks that summer. Naturally, these walks to the payphone would become less frequent and would eventually stop altogether. Life was weird. Life is weird. The Duffel Bag During your early teen years, it's normal for certain events to take place that are burned into your memory for a lifetime. Whether the event that was committed to memory was good or bad, that time is incredibly impressionable. One memory that sticks out for me isn't a happy one, but I remember it like it was yesterday and it literally changed how society operates. When the attacks on September 11, 2001 took place, I was 13 years old. I was still living in Gelnhausen, Germany, and had just come home from school that day. Due to the time zone difference, my school day was ending, but the horrific events were still unfolding stateside. The Today Show was airing on the Armed Forces Network, or AFN, and like millions around the world, I sat and watched as lives ended and our reality changed forever. What none of us knew at that point was just how much life would change. My house was not on a military installation. The commander's quarters at that time was located on top of a hill next to a small American hotel, surrounded by farmland and goats. Needless to say, it was a pretty vulnerable place to be located, and not knowing how the world was going to change after that terrible day, we were all on the edge of our seats. Within a few short days, a guard shack was erected at the bottom of my driveway. Yes, I am serious. Staffed 24-7, a group of soldiers stood guard. They also performed exterior searches of my house. I can remember sitting in my living room one evening and seeing a soldier carrying his rifle walk past my window. He was walking through the bushes and at his side was a military working dog. This would normally startle me or any other normal person on any other day, but during this period of unknown, I was simply thankful that they were there. School was out for a few days while security at the installations and the logistics of American kids being bussed in from neighboring towns for school was determined, a process we previously did every day without a care in the world. My morning walk to the bus stop, previously uneventful, now included a stroll past the American soldiers in my driveway, heavily armed, ready to do what they do. I recall being intimidated as I walked by, occasionally uttering a soft, hello, or good morning. On a few occasions, I even had to show my military-dependent ID card just to get back up my driveway after school. On the first day back to school and for the following few weeks, getting on our school bus, which was a German city bus the U.S. government used to transport us to a neighboring post for school, was an experience in itself. Sitting in the left side front row seat as I walked on the bus was a soldier in full combat gear heavily armed and keeping a watchful eye as we boarded. 
Once boarded and in our seats, we had to show our military-dependent ID cards as the soldier walked up and down the aisle of the bus. The security precautions did not stop there. Driving in front of our bus was a U.S. military police vehicle, and following closely behind was a German police vehicle. I remember vividly how quiet the bus was. The sound of laughter and kids being kids was notably absent, and I imagine everyone was unsure what to think or feel. Arriving at the Army installation where our school was located was yet another surreal experience. By this time, the attack stateside had been confirmed as terrorism, and as such, there was no way of knowing if other attacks would take place. As our bus approached the entrance gate, we sat in line with several other vehicles while the exterior and bottom of the bus was inspected for potential explosives and other threats. I wasn't thinking about tests, homework, girlfriends, skateboarding, guitar, what my friends were up to that coming weekend, or any other trivial thing that make up the bulk of a 13-year-old's existence. Instead, we were all forced to experience the changing environment around us, the new norms, and uncertainty. After school, as we made our way off post, I remember looking out the bus window and seeing flowers, American flags, German flags, and signs that the German community had begun leaving against the exterior chain-link fence near the entrance and exit points. You have to remember, I was 13, and at that age, you just don't realize the history of the place you live, especially in an international community. It was at this moment, however, when I realized that the German community was hurting alongside their American friends and neighbors, and we meant much more to them than just the Americans who shop in their stores and support each other militarily. In the following weeks, as I began to hang out with friends at neighboring posts, and as we all tried to figure out some sense of normalcy, I remember seeing something I will never forget. Next to the front door of a friend's apartment was a packed green army-issued duffel bag. My friend's father knew that the horrific events that took place weeks prior would likely plunge the U.S. and its allies into war. The duffel bag was present in preparation for when the call came. As many who donned the nation's uniform had done throughout our history, he was ready to leave at a moment's notice to defend everything we hold sacred. I imagine similar preparations were underway in many military homes across the globe during that time. I have always been proud of our armed forces. Even at that age, I carried a sense of pride to not just call myself an American, but to know I was part of a military family. In retrospect, The image of that duffel bag sitting next to the front door of a house as kids and a spouse sat just feet away represented more than I could have ever imagined. They knew that the day would likely come for that soldier to pick up that duffel bag, exit the place they called home, and possibly never return. Unfortunately, this would be the reality for thousands of service members and their families over the next 17 years. I often step back and think about that fact. At the time of writing this book, our nation has been at war for 17 years. The same campaigns that started when I was in junior high are still underway at my age of 31. That's a heavy fact to ponder. One of the reasons I chose to describe at length the upbringing I had as an army brat is to help educate those who may not be familiar with what it's like to grow up in a military family. I remember going back to Virginia in December of 2001 on emergency leave with my family to visit my grandmother, whose health was failing. I used some of the time to visit with friends I had moved away from a year or so prior. I remember one friend asking me, Dude, did you hear about what happened on 9-11? Now knowing what I shared in the paragraph above, you can imagine my confusion at his question. As if me moving to another country would somehow place me on an island, cut off from the events of the world, which is, ironically, what I also thought would happen before I moved overseas. However, as an army brat, I understood that not everyone gets it, and I politely confirmed that I was indeed aware of what transpired. Although 9-11 was of the darkest days in our nation's history, it forced me at a young age to become more in tune with current events, to make an effort to understand cultures outside of my own, to be incredibly thankful for my life, and to move forward in life with a healthy amount of perspective. Life Lessons from Skateboarding There was no way I could write a book about key moments and lessons learned in my life without talking about skateboarding. 
From age 12 to 22, I was an avid street skateboarder. When I moved to Germany in the seventh grade, a few of my friends had just started skating, so naturally, I joined in. Little did I know, this board covered in grip tape and rolling on four wheels would be like an appendage for the next decade. Skateboarding is a culture. If you are a skateboarder, you know what I mean when I refer to this incredible sport as a way of life. For those not in the know, let me tell you. It's like speaking a language everyone in the tribe understands. It doesn't matter what language you speak, what neighborhood you live in, or how long you've been skateboarding. When you are with other skaters, you all understand each other. From the moment I stepped foot on that seven and three quarter inch wide board, I was obsessed. Seriously, I lived and breathed skateboarding, constantly craving the feeling of cruising the streets, learning tricks, and hyping up my friends. If I wasn't out skating, I was watching skate videos. If I wasn't watching skate videos, I was out skating. This was a daily cycle that never missed a beat. I can still remember getting my first real board or deck and skate shoes. The deck was a Jamie Thomas model by the brand Zero, and the shoes were by a brand called DVS. The deck featured an iconic photo of Jamie Thomas doing what's called a smith grind down a massive handrail. The shoes were all white and had a few blue accents if I recall. This was in the early 2000s when skate shoes were super bulky. I honestly don't think I could skate in them if I tried in present day. But let me tell you, I literally skated those shoes until my left foot came through the hole that gradually widened from hundreds, maybe thousands, of attempts at learning a kickflip. I swear I went through two tubes of shoe goo, pumping new life into them every few days. Ah, shoe goo. Good times. As mentioned earlier, I lived in Germany when I first started skating, and I'm so lucky I did. I literally skateboarded around Europe with my friends between the ages of 13 and 15. Who the hell gets to do that? My friends and I would jump on a train and explore every city and town looking for new places to skate. The beauty of street skating is that everything around you is a skate park. Ledges, stairs, handrails, embankments, curbs. It was all fair game. We would skate one spot for a bit and then move on to the next. Getting kicked out of skate spots by store owners or security guards was and still is a normal part of street skating. We, of course, were always respectful and left right away. <laughs> yeah, okay. I remember going to see some of our favorite professional skaters when they came to town on tour. Tony Hawk, Paul Rodriguez, Bam Margera, Bob Bernquist, PJ Ladd, Jason Ellis, Eric Costin, Mike Taylor, and many others. I'm proud to say that my friends and I met them all. It was incredible. I remember how they thought it was pretty cool to see these little American skate kids coming to see them in the middle of Germany. Funny story, somehow my mom snuck past security and ended up standing next to Tony Hawk. She leaned over to him and thanked him for taking the time to come out and put on such a great show for the kids. In my best 13-year-old voice, oh, oh my god, okay mom, please, Stop talking to Tony Hawk. So how did skateboarding teach me valuable life skills? Many things I learned were lessons that I did not quite realize until later, although others were more immediate. Most notably, the sport taught me about perseverance. In skateboarding, you attempt new tricks over time as your skills develop, varying in degree of difficulty. In most cases, especially early on, you will not land at first try. Second try? Nope. 100th try? Maybe not even then. With every failed attempt, you learn something new. Whether it be foot placement, weight distribution, angle of attack, or speed, you make small adjustments until you finally land it. When you finally land the trick you've been working on, there are a few other things that give you a bigger sense of accomplishment. The only people happier than you? Your fellow skateboarders. Yes, skateboarding is an individual sport in terms of the definition of a traditional sports team, but a large part of my energy and encouragement came from seeing my friends progressing and adding new tricks to their arsenals. I could always count on my friends to be ready to go skate and we collectively helped each other improve our skills. I credit these years to developing the aspect of my personality that is always encouraging those around me to succeed. For an individual sport, it sure as hell had the most mutually supportive vibe than any traditional sport I ever played growing up. 
Today, this hasn't changed in the world of skateboarding. Turn on any televised event or go to your local skate park. You will see the pure love and encouragement each skater shows for the other. It really is a beautiful thing. While skateboarding around Europe, the sport also introduced me to other cultures, people who didn't look or sound like me, and people who came from different socioeconomic backgrounds. As I mentioned earlier, once you stepped on that board, all the shit that in present day divides so many truly didn't matter to any of us. We came together for the love of the sport, to see each other land new tricks, and to just have a good time. We were hungry teenage boys, so stopping at different restaurants around town was a big part of our adventures. We tried food from a melting pot of cultures, and it was freaking awesome. There was a little donor kebab restaurant down the street from my house. It was owned by a Turkish family and quickly became one of our frequent snack spots. After a long day of skating, my friends and I would stop by, grab a donor kebab and pommes frites, or french fries, and head back to my house to, you guessed it, watch skate videos. It also didn't hurt that girls tended to flock toward the skateboarders. If you learn the history of skateboarding, that wasn't always the case, but I'm lucky that I started when I did. Ironically, for me, girls were usually the reason I stepped off the skateboard. Funny how that works. Listen, when you have the choice to make out with a chick or skate, you gotta do what you gotta do. I mean, my skateboard would always let me skateboard, you know? <laughs> 